build our understanding, our shared understanding of what the future is going to look like. Um, and all of a sudden, when someone asks you sorry, what the future is going to look like, I mean, that they ask you to come, and they'll say, um, our party policy analysts have decided that we're going to build $14 billion worth of roads, take it or leave it. Um, but that approach sucks. I hate that approach. I'm sure that you guys hate that approach. And the big thing that happens is that we all say, well, I guess the future is something that's decided on by some bureaucrat in Wellington, um, some guy uh, writing a desk. But Olay doesn't want to be like that. We want the future to be something that we all build together, that we grab with both of our hands and force to be the thing that we want to do. So rather than OA inviting you here and saying, uh, our policy analysts went off and we had a, a very important transnational conference call with a think tank based out of Washington, D.C. <laughs> and the CIA has decided for us that the program's going to be We asked you guys to come here and we, um, we're really honored that you guys are here with us and you and myself, that we can all talk together about what the future of looks like, what you guys want the future to look like, so we can build the power together to make that our future. So, today is constitutional transformation. This isn't the only story that we do. We talk about housing, about employment, about health care, about all the stuff that's important to us, all the stuff that makes the future worth living in. But today we're talking about constitutional transformation and about the stuff of colonization. So, first of all, I have a few things. Emergency exits are over there or through the nearest window. <laughs> 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 but I got struck by a bee this morning, I got smoke in my eye, so the next thing on the list I think is a small container fire. So <laughs> should that break out, leave. <laughs> These are all flammable, so I'm trusting you to understand that. Take responsibility for that. Um, we're going to have uh, really very, I'm honored to see that here, have our speakers recorded off for about an hour or for however long they want. I'm not their boss. <laughs> I don't even believe in bosses. I'm a communist. <laughs> <laughs> Once these guys finish talking, um, we're going to have some Kai. I think over in the Funny Kai, right here. Mm -hmm. In the Funny Kai, a very tall comment here is pointing from. So we should have been there for some food. And then we'll come back and we'll have a group discussion. And we'll see everyone is here about what you think is important. What the frequency that resonated with you, what ideas you think are important, and we'll hash it out together, yeah? Mm -hmm. Um, that's the only way we ever get ideas that are with that is by working in it together. That's how Maui have always made decisions, and that's how we want to make decisions now. So, um, very little further ado, I just want to introduce our first speaker for the rest of the session. So, Uh, and the 
really Ikea Koto. So um, I estimated that there was going to be at most 40 people here, which is why you only have 40 handouts. <laughs> I'm talking about the work of Matika Mayal Tauro and the report that has been out since 2016. So I do want to move through a lot of it fairly quickly, but what I would ask you is if at any stage you want me to explain something a bit further, please just yell. I'm as blind as a bat, okay? <laughs> so you have to yell if you want to me to answer because there are quite a few things in there that if you in here that if you haven't heard about it before you will wonder what I'm talking about. Please just ask. Okay. So um no, I can't read what's up there. Uh, so I was asked to come here today to talk about the work of my book in my old uh, and my preference would have had been to have Moana Jackson here with us as well because both of us have led this work. Moana, if you don't know about it, um, just before Christmas was diagnosed with cancer and um, he's, please keep him in your prayers, uh, he's, he's going through a very tough time. Uh, so, that leaves me. logo. And this logo was drawn up for us by Rangatahi when we said to them right at the beginning of the process, please draw us up something that portrays where we want to end up in this process of constitutional transformation. And this is um, a stylized uh, logo, a stylized portrayal of uh, Aotearoa te Tika Maui of our North Island as a uh, pakaurua, a uh, stingray, as is the shape of the island, but it's with everything in balance. So the sun and the moon are in balance. All of uh, the children of Papatua, Nuku, and Ranginui are in balance. So the fish of the sea, the plants and trees of the land, the sun and the moon, uh, the mountains, and everything else that's underneath it, everything is in balance, including the human beings that are a part of that. So at the moment, of course, we're not. We're totally unbalanced. So what we're aiming for is to set the balance right again. So that's why that logo is like it is. The person who actually drew it up is the one who gives you the whole lot. It's a beautiful story. And I wish you'd write it down for me. Um, okay. Sorry. All right, so the reference just put through this slide. Uh, this is the thing that you can Google. Uh, and as I say, just Google Constitutional Transformation. You'll come up with this report. Um, I, I don't like to assume. How many of you have actually seen this report? Read this report. Okay, that's good because that gives me a better idea. Okay, now, um, Yeah, some of you 
love us, some of you hate us, I have to work with us. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't have to come and put me in there to work with us. And I came out of it um, on Wednesday, very, very grumpy. So I can't, I can't bear the way some of our Iwi chairs and their uh, workers want to trade our rights for money. I hate it. So I was very grumpy. Um, we'll sort it out though. Now, uh, the reason it was set up was because of the powerlessness that Māori have within the current constitutional uh, arrangements. We, the way this thing went was that we were having a hui up in Waitangi and I was the designated chair for the day. We share it in, throughout the Te Tokiro when they're in Waitangi. And Moana Jackson was outside and I said to her, Moana, we want to do a big project on constitutional transformation. Will you please lead it? And I thought, oh God, I'm going to get all sorts. And he looked at me and he said, I would love to. And so that was what was put to National Iwi Chairs from them. One, this work was extremely urgent, and two, Minor Jackson would do it. And they went, yes, absolutely. So for all the criticisms about National Iwi Chairs from, there is no question about the need for constitutional transformation. Uh, and then they then said, oh, and Margaret, you will chair it. And I said, well, what do I chair it for? Oh, because you're the one who can keep up with Minor. Um, <laughs> I don't know about that, but in actual fact, why is very easy to work with that. Um, so, the reason we ended up setting up a formal group to do this was because in the processes that National Iwi Chairs Forum was doing, we were trying to work on the usual things, housing, health, homelessness, uh, or the whole range of things that impact upon Māori. And we would do a huge amount of work in a particular area, think we were making progress, get so far and hit a brick wall. And the brick wall was that we were never allowed to be part of the decision making as to what would happen. And so whatever we said, the decision would come down on us whether we liked it or not. Uh, and every single one of the groups who was working was hitting the same brick wall every time. So as a result of that, uh, we were prevented from addressing injustices, inequities, denial of rights, land confiscation, racism, the whole lot that is the result of the doctrine of discovery and colonization in this country. Now, I have this habit of asking questions that I don't mean to embarrass people, but are there people in here who do not know what the doctrine of discovery is? Okay. So it, it rather concerns me on the lack of knowledge of the doctrine of discovery in this country. Um, and at National Iwi Chairs Forum, even though I discuss these things at great length in National Iwi Chairs Forum, on Tuesday or Wednesday, I got the question, Margaret, what is the doctrine of discovery? The first thing I will say is Google it. Now, what it comes to is Originally, in the 1500s, there were papal bulls, things called papal bulls. Now, these are edicts that come out of the Vatican and Rome from the Pope. And these edicts were authorised people like Columbus uh, and any other white Christians to go into the countries of non-white, non-Christians, take over the lands, resources, territories, exterminate the people or enslave them, and just completely take over everything that was theirs. So they were authorised to do this. Now what you often hear that referred to these days is white supremacy, but that is the origin of white supremacy, is these edicts out of the Pope in Rome, okay, out, of both, out of the Pope in the Vatican. Now, <clears throat> don't forget the stick in the rake. Oh yes, so the way you do this thing is you take a stick and you put a piece of coloured rag on it and you step onto somebody else's benoit and you go, I claim this in the name of the Pope, the King of somewhere or something like that. Okay? That's how it was carried out. 
Now, for that applied for the Catholic um, countries in Europe, but the Protestant countries followed on and you got royal pro proclamations. And that's what Cook came to this country under, the authority of a royal proclamation that authorised him to do exactly that, go into the lands of non-white, non-Christian, take them over, enslave, exterminate the people who were there. Okay? Now, the doctrine of discovery is fundamentally important to this country because it's what underpins our legal and social system in this country. And you don't have to scratch the surface of the public service very much to get um, officials, bureaucrats say to you, oh no, we can't do that because of the doctrine of discovery. But if you don't understand what the doctrine of discovery is, then you can't understand just how uh, atrocious that statement is. Yeah? So uh, the Office of Treaty Settlements does it regularly. Crown Law does it regularly. The doctrine of discovery underpins everything in this country. Nationally, we cheers from has resolved that we will ask Jacinda Ardern to issue a statement repudiating or rejecting the doctrine of discovery. I suspect that that is going to take a while <laughs> to happen. Um, and when I have some EWE chairs who go, oh, Margaret, isn't that a bit hard? Oh, no. Okay. Now, constitutional transformation is required to reinstate the balance, as I said, between Manamotu Hake, now Manamotu Hake, it often gets translated as Māori sovereignty. Be very careful about that term sovereignty. Sovereignty comes from the English culture out of the English language. But Manamāori Motu Hake is about power and authority, absolute and ultimate power and authority derived from the gods. The closest notion you have to it in English is sovereignty, but the two are not the same. So you just need to be careful about that. So you need a balance between that and British kāwanatanga. Now kāwanatanga, and I'm, I'm starting to see things in media from our own people who I think would know better, saying that kāwanatanga was about governance over everybody in this country. It was not. Kāwanatanga was about the right to keep the British immigrants from being lawless. They were horrifically lawless when they came here, to the point that Russell was where they were all, Kororareka, where they all were, was called the hellhole of the Pacific because they were just totally lawless. The purpose of Kawanatanga was to keep them under control. It was nothing to do with having any say over Māori in the country. So um, that's something that I ask you to please just keep a finger on. I was quite surprised when I saw in the Herald somebody saying that I would have expected to know better that Kawanatanga is for all of us. It's not. Um, now, so that was what was agreed to. The next uh, one, I think that just where I'm standing means I can't read what's on this. Our terms of reference, you can flip that on the slide down. The job that Matikumai Aotearoa was given was this, to develop and implement a model for an inclusive constitution for Aotearoa. Now that word inclusive is very, very important because what you have the constitutional arrangements, does everybody know this country doesn't have a recognized written constitution? Okay. So we do actually have a written constitution, it is, Te Hapaputanga, or Te Ranga Tiratanga on New Tereni, and it's what I refer to as its codicil, Te Tereni of Waitangi. But the constitutional arrangements you have in this country were put in place based on uh, Westminster requirements. They come from England. They were built, put in place for English and by and large for English men who were wealthy. That's what the constitutional arrangements here are for. The result of that is that many are excluded from it, and we all know how people are excluded here. That is why our job was to get something that was inclusive. So very important, that one. 
They had to be based on tikanga and kawa. We use both those terms because it's sometimes known as tikanga, which for us at home is our laws. Uh, elsewhere in the country it's known as kawa. He hakaputanga o te ranga tira tanga o New Tirini, that is the 1835 Declaration of Sovereignty. They often refer to it as the Declaration of Independence. It was much more than that. And the closest word in English is sovereignty, but it was a declaration <coughs> of the fact that the mana of this country rests in the hapu. And it's the hapu who have complete and absolute power and authority throughout the country. And that nobody else shall make laws uh, except those hapu. Uh, and that they would, uh, what did they do? They thanked the British for recognizing the flag that they had to have. You all know the Whakamininga flag, okay? Which was the flag they had to have to stop their boats getting arrested and taken off them and confiscated when they went to Sydney. It's, um, I think our chupuna were a bit um, pragmatic in the way they dealt with these things. Uh, so, he hakaputanga. In my Tano, he hakaputanga is just, we've always known about it, mainly because my tūpuna signed it. As I go around the country, I realise that there are a lot of places where Māori around the country know nothing about he hakaputanga. For us in the Tai Tukido, it's our baseline. It's an extremely important document. It sets out where sovereignty lies in this country. Um, then te tiri te o waitangi. Uh, I've already said to you about kawana tonga and rangatira tonga. And other indigenous rights instruments that enjoy a wide range of international recognition. Now, that's, so we're going into the international uh, fora. In the United Nations, I have misgivings about the United Nations because that is the state's. However, there are some very good parts of the, uh, the United Nations that over the last, I'd say, 10 years have been very helpful to us. So we have UNDRIP, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. That is very helpful for us as providing not rights that we have been given, for heaven's sake, they are standards of rights that are ours as of right. It's not as if there's something more. They're actually less than the human rights that are recognized in the uh, United Nations. So those are the things that we're working off. And the very clear message that came to us that the Westminster constitutional system as implemented since 1840 does not and cannot give effect to Te Tiriti or Waitangi. It wasn't put in place for that purpose anyway. So it's never ever. And there's no good tweaking it, because it wasn't put there for that purpose anyway. All right, so going down to, oh, what were we aiming to do in a general sense? So that's to create a future environment where, one, Māori are fully recognised and respected. Instead of being this, we're on the margins of everything. Uh, if you're Māori, you're born on the margins. So we want that, that we are fully recognised and respected. That tikanga, our laws, mātauranga Māori, our way of understanding the world, our knowledge, te hakaputanga and titiriti are a natural part of the country. In other words, when uh, children go to school, part of what they learn as being the way the world is, is about te hakaputanga and titiriti. Uh, that hapu and iwi exercise their own mana. And that there's just no question about the fact that we make our own decisions about our own lives on our own land. The Constitution is for good, oh sorry, all people have a respective constitutional place. So instead of just the rich white males who have a very respective constitutional place in this country, it's everyone. Uh, that a constitution for good, just and participatory government for all and by all people is consistent with the values, those values and benefits people. Now I'm going to go through the values for you that were in the report. But your constitution at the moment 
as we were doing this exercise, and Tanya will have noticed this as you went round, you asked people what are the values that underpin this country, people can't tell you. You go to a fleet, and the people will just rattle off all the all the tangas, all the patriarchy tanga, the matera tanga, da 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 da. But for most New Zealanders, they don't have a clue. Uh, all New Zealanders will prosper and celebrate heritage. To me, that just shouldn't be a push. <laughs> Māori contribute positively to the growing international activity around constitutional transformation for Indigenous people. From what I am seeing when I visit the United Nations, we here, Māori here, are seen as being at the forefront of this sort of work. But there is a lot of very good work being done elsewhere as well. Uh, and I see it, the, the countries that I take most note of because they've got the most similar arrangements to us is Australia, Canada and the United States. And there's some very good work being done there that we can learn from them as well. Now, moving on from that to the report itself. So, there are... Moana wrote most of this report. I would have written half a dozen pages of it. He did the rest of it. It's 125 pages. That sounds like a lot, but it is not, and the reason Moana wrote it is it's not an academic document. Okay? Um, and he wrote it for our people so that it was easy to read and simple. But even though it's really easy to read and simple, please read it carefully because every sentence has a lot of depth and thinking behind it. Moana took three years to write that report. It drove me nearly crazy. <laughs> uh, but the reason he did that was so that he could make sure that every single sentence was very, very carefully crafted. So you read it through and you think, oh yeah, that sounds right. Just read it again. Okay? And think about the depth behind it. So he split it up into five parts. The nature of constitutions, constitutional foundations, the values, the vision. And that's what I would like groups like this to please think about that vision. And then the recommendations that came out of it. Now, the nature of constitutions. One of the things that we found very early on in the piece was that people assumed that constitutions were too complicated uh, and that you had to have legal training uh, and you had to have constitutional law training to even understand what a constitution is. What a load of rubbish. Okay? And Wanda was just so great as he would explain to the people that constitutions are simply about making decisions. And what he would say to people as he went around is, on your what I, do you know how to make decisions? Yeah, of course we know how to make decisions on your what I. That's a constitutional action behavior. People make constitutional decisions all the time. So, first of all, it's about making decisions. Now, government is the process people choose to regulate their affairs. And what's important about this is it's the people who decide this, not constitutional lawyers, it's the people. And a constitution is a code or set of rules to describe how government will function, who will make the rules, how to abide by them and live together amicably. And what makes a constitution work is that it has come out of the people. And that is why, in the work of Martika and my Aotearoa, both right. Moana and I did not want to sit down and talk to the government about this until the people were okay with it. Because at the end of the day, that's what government is meant to be there for, is to carry out the wishes of the people. Yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> now, constitutions, there's two things that underpin what constitutions are. So they're based on concept of power and the sight of power. Now, the concept of power is the philosophy of constitutional authority and the values that underpin it. Now, that might sound a little bit complex, but I'm going to give you an example. And then the sight of power 
It's the institutional place where society decides power is exercised and the limits that are placed on it. Mm. All right. Now, going over, so it is absolutely key to remember that constitutions are cultural creations. We will hear that the constitution of this country has to be based on the one that came out of Europe. Well, the constitutions in Europe are for Europe. They're not for this country, which is why they don't work here. The culture here is not just a European culture, although I know that's what they try to do. That's the doctrine of discovery, okay? But for a constitution to be come out of the people of here, it cannot be the same as what it is in Europe. So it's a cultural co uh, creation. And just to show you the difference and how different constitutional makeups can be. I've got two examples here. One comes out of um, the Western concept and the other is the Maori concept. So the Western concept and site of power is very hierarchical. It's top down. Okay? The top makes the decision and opposes it. And in that system, sovereignty is the most high and perpetual power over the citizen you'll recognize that as what we've got here in this country. And the site is the monarch and parliament. And we still go through that process here where the monarch opens parliament each year with absolute authority and dominion over the land and the people. Okay? So that's the Western concept. It's out of Europe. The Maori concept and site of power the concept of power for us is mana, and we know that. Absolute power and authority derived from the gods. Mm. That is our definition of power. The sight of power is in our ariki or our rangatira. Up home, we use rangatira for our leaders. Elsewhere, they are also referred to as ariki, the very um, senior one. Now, there is a big difference here because power is bestowed by the people to be exercised in a way that is thicker. I do hear people saying, oh, in the old days, the rangatira had absolute say and what they said went. That is not an accurate representation. The rangatira's job was to listen to the people, hear what they were saying, and then make his decision based on what the people wanted. Because it's really simple. If a rangatira ends up making a decision that the people don't like, he won't be a rangatira for very long. He's gone. Okay? And remember what the word rangatira actually means. Rangatira, the job of a rangatira is to keep the people together. And ranga, uh, you can, this is how my co-master explained it, a ranga, is um, a shoal, that's the word for a shoal of fish. Okay? And if you think about a shoal of fish, they will all swim together, sometimes they peel off, but they'll all come back together again. And then there's a tira, and a tira is a group of people, and the question that went with this, is all he can hear, of course, um, you see a shoal of fish swimming in the sea, and they're all keeping together. You look to the land and there is a tira, a group of people wandering aimlessly. Who, are go who is going to bring those people together so that they can move as one? And the answer is a rangatira. That's a very different concept from a sovereign in the Western world. Very different. Now, <clears throat> The key thing about um, power in the Māori world is that decisions are made by consensus. And for us in Ngāti Kahu, we don't actually know how to do it any other way. When we're told to vote for something, I, I've been the chair of the Runanga of Ngāti Kahu for 20 years. We do not vote. If people don't agree with something, well, you go away and come back and we'll do it, we'll talk about it again until people are okay. You are going to have times when there are ones who are never going to agree, 
But the way it usually works is they say, all right, we don't agree, but we will abide by what the people say. And that's how it is. What the people say. Um, so consensus is hugely important. It cares for the people. This is monarchy time. Okay? Your constitution must care for your people. It keeps the people together. That's that Rangatira thing of keeping the people together. And the hapu and iwi must be independent. No hapu can override another hapu. No iwi can override another iwi. And when we get bullies in the national iwi cheers for them, we just sit back and say, uh 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 uh. Do not, you big iwi in the north, tell Nati Kapu what to do. <laughs> so, all right. So that's the nature of constitutions and how different they are in different parts of the world and different cultures. Now the second thing is the foundations that we were asked to set this up on. First of all, to come. So I've already given you this. This is in our terms of reference. Te um, hapa Te tiriti o Waitangi. We did look to international precedents. And by the way, in the book, this is a down presentation for what I usually do. Um, the work that we were doing didn't start in 2010. It started back in the early 1800s. So we're working off a long um, lot of precedent when we're doing this work. The international precedents we looked at are listed there, the Karaoke De Declaration of 1992 about the inalienable rights to land and territories and sources of water. Uh, the Matatua Declaration of 1993, Cultural and uh, Intellectual Property Rights, and of course the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. And all of these are framed within the right to self-determination. And that of course is something that, the reason you have the horrific statistical reality for Māori, where we're, you know, homeless, poverty, imprisoned and what have you, uh, is because we have been stripped of our right to self-determination. Uh, we also looked at what the Sami were doing, and um, Sami, Sami are from Scandinavia and Russia, okay? They have their own Sami parliament. So we had a look at them, and they said, please don't do what we did. <laughs> to, it can be vetoed by the Norwegian Parliament. And they're finding that hugely difficult. And I'm thinking, why would you do that? Uh, Bolivia. <coughs> Bolivia was looking great until a little while ago. Uh, uh, and I, I don't know how much of that is document discovery coming back through into Bolivia. Um, Native Americans. There is, although Native Americans are still oppressed, by the United States and their laws, there is a level of self-determination that goes on uh, in some of them. It's not ideal, but hey, you have a look at it. Now, the constitutional values. All right, the constitutional values. When we went round and did all this work, there were 252 hui around the country, by the way, on this. The way it went was, uh, we didn't say we're coming somewhere and, you know, come to our hui. We said, if you want us to come and talk to you, we'll come and talk to you. And we had 252 requests. For it. So that's another reason why it took so long. Wana Jackson went to every single one of those hui. I went to about 60 of them. But in addition to that, we set up Rangatahi Group with Panya had a great deal to do with for this region here. And they ran another <coughs> 70 uh, of their own. Theirs were a lot more exciting than ours. <laughs> <laughs> they had all with playing sorts of stuff. We were signing big flags. And it was great. We sort of... Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, this was what the people wanted to talk about, was the values that underpinned what we were doing. And the people's thinking was, if you get the underlying values right, the rest of it will flow out of it naturally. So, first of all, the value of tikanga. 
and that is to relate to or incorporate the core ideals and the ought to be of living in Aotearoa. Now, what happened with that was, we said we should live according to Te Pauna, and people go, oh, well, you know our people don't. And you say that they shouldn't do this, and what do they do? They go and do it. And one of the answers to that was, yes, we know, because that's us. We're human beings. We break the rules. But if you don't set an ideal that you want to go after, then you've got nothing to aim for. And so you set down what I've got up here in the presentation, the ought to be. What things ought to be. And that's what values are about. It's about what ought to be. Okay. Then the value of community. To facilitate the fair representation and good relationships between all people. So that we can get away from this individualistic idea and come together as a community. Uh, the value of belonging, to foster the sense of belonging for everyone in the community, instead of half of us feeling alienated, marginalised, that everybody feels that they belong. The value of place, now this one was hugely important, to promote relationships with and to ensure the protection of Papa Tuanuku. And this was a lead that was given out of Bolivia because their first rule uh, in their constitution, their constitution is a, an indigenous-based constitution, and the first rule in their constitution is the law of Pachamama. Pachamama is our Papa Tuanuku, because if you do not look after her, we're gone. So the first law must always be to the well-being of Papa Tuanuku or Pachamama. So that was the value of place. And then on the next slide is the value of balance. <coughs> to respect for, to ensure respect for the authority of Langatiratanga and Kaumanatanga. One or two of my whanaunga up home in particular said, just send them all back home. And our kaumatua said, no, 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 we invited them here. They are here. Mm. Now we've just got to learn to get on with each other and restore the balance. Yeah, and some of our young ones are very impatient. <laughs> uh, but I must say that at the end of the day, because Moana, they tried to challenge me, um, my own um, nephew, mm -hmm. trying to challenge me, and I'm saying, but it's not what I hear our Kui and Kaumatra and the Fano and Hapu saying. So off he went and had a go at uh, Moana, and Moana said, it's not what the people said. So, yeah. Uh, the value of conciliation. Now, this is something that I have heard ever since I was really young about how hard we had the situation is. To have the underlying jurisdictional base and means of resolution to guarantee a conciliatory and consensual democracy. Now, the importance of that is that at the moment what you have is an adversarial and majoritarian mind where you rely on being winners and losers and that the um, you know 51 percent can overrule the 49 percent i remember very early in the piece where we did have a vote in nati and it came out like about uh that 51 49 the kaumato said no no because what that means is that half the people don't agree. How are you going to work with that? Okay. Um, so, that instead of having that adversary you're always got to have a go at each other thing, you have conciliatory. So, something, another thing I was taught very when I was very young, never go to agree with your ma mind made up as to what it is that's going to come out of that hui. You go to the hui willing to listen to others and to reconcile on the differences. And you won't know what they are until you hear everybody. So these fixed positions do not allow you to be conciliatory. Okay? That are being flexible. And then the consensual one about let's keep working on it until we're agreed. Or at least the vast majority. 
So that's the value of reconciliation and then the value of structure. To have, a stru to have structural conventions that promote basic democratic ideals of fair representation, openness and transparency. And one of the things I used to say to Moana was, democracy, our people see democracy as one man, one vote. That's not us. It's not how we are. And he said, no, you need to understand the real meaning of democracy. And democracy is about by the people, for the people. The democracy has sort of been, if you like, uh, reinterpreted to mean this one man, one vote thing majoritarian thing. It is not the true meaning of democracy. Democracy is decisions by the people for the people. So, a democracy that has fair representation, openness and transparency, not like the crazy situation we've had, for example, with here, with Yidu Matal, where for a whole lot of time you didn't know what was going on. What's that? You know? It's all to do with the nature of that sort of thinking that says there are winners and losers. And in order to be winners and lo or winners, you've got to be secretive. That does not lead to good decision making. Okay. All right, so those are the values. Now, the next one is the ones that we've talked about all of these things for quite some time throughout Māori Dham, throughout those weeks, but for over, it's 11 years now. At the end of all of this, Moana and I and our group of Matika and all we had to come up, we were supposed to come up with one model. Well, we couldn't do one model. <laughs> we did six. <laughs> so, these are suggested <laughs> models. And what we said was, look, we, this is what we think falls out of what you've told us. We don't know whether any of them is okay. But if you have a look at all of them, then maybe you can think of what will actually work. So, the first one, what you've got here is the arrangements that the country has, the decision-making processes that, that you have. And the first one is what we call a tricameral model. And tricameral simply means that you have three groups involved in it. So I'm going to show you a bicameral and a unicameral as well. So there are tricameral, and in the tricamerals, uh, we've got three models in there for tricameral. Uh, in the tricameral model, and then actually, well no, not all of them, you have the Tinoranga Tiratanga, what we call the sphere. Now, we got this thinking about a sphere out of the report of the Waitangi Tribunal that it issued in 2014 about the Hapakutanga and Te Tiriti out of the Ngāpuri claims. Now that was a very, very important report from the tribunal. And what they talked about was the fact that Māori have our own area of influence, our own sphere of influence. And Pākehā have their sphere of influence. And they talked about the different spheres of influence between the Crown representing Pākehā and Māori. And what the tribunal ended up doing was calling the Māori sphere of influence the Tinoranga Tiratanga sphere. And the Pākehā sphere of influence the Kāwanatanga sphere. So you would have these two spheres. At the moment what you have is the Kāwanatanga sphere completely overriding the Tinoranga Tiratanga sphere. You need to separate those two out so you have a decision-making body for Māori, a decision-making body for the Crown's people, the rest of the country, and then in a tricameral organisation of things, you would have a third body where you would have representative from the Kawanatanga side, from the Rangatiratanga side, who would come together to a joint deliberative body. Okay. And that's where you would make joint decisions where it affects both Māori and non-Māori. But decisions that affect Māori and Māori only would be made in the Tinoranga Tiratanga sphere. The Crown would make decisions for its area in the Kawanatanga sphere. 
our people, it was really interesting, our people did not talk about changing the crown. There was just no discussion about that. Uh, and they just said, no, leave, leave them over there with their thing. It's up to them to decide what they do with their crown uh, area, with their kawanatanga sphere. The thing that would be different is that they would no longer have any power to make decisions for Māori. That would all be taken out and put on the kawanatanga side. All right, so that's the first model that we have, and in that, sorry, there is another, if you just click down here. In that Tinoranga Tinatanga sphere, it would be made up of representatives of iwi and hapu. Okay. Now, if you turn it on, so the next one <laughs> is again a tricameral one, but in this one, the Rangatiratanga side is not just Fano, oh, sorry, hapu and iwi. It includes, I've got here and on the diagram you'll see urban, but that, I just couldn't fit it on the side. It's for all other groups. So, rangatahi, women, uh, LGBTQI+, uh, disabled, all those groups who are currently marginalised but have organised themselves into groups so that they can be heard that there would be room for them to have representation in a body like this. Okay? Um, and that's, that's the only difference between this and the first one. It's a different makeup in the Tinoranga Tiratanga sphere. The other two would remain the same. Then the third tricameral model is Instead of the, the difference in the third one is that in the relational sphere where you come together to make the decision, it wouldn't be nationally based, it would be regionally based. Uh, all right, so those are the three possible things that we thought fell out of the corridor from the tricameral. We go over to the next one, and this one's a multi. Um, Sphere model that uh, when Wana first showed me, this one, what the hell is that? Uh, and what it is is that a lot of iwi and hapu have already got arrangements, agreements with the crowd that they've had maybe through their treaty settlements or whatever that they do not want to give up and don't want to have interfered with. So you will preserve those, and that's what's in the middle of that diagram. Mana motuhake iwi hapu crown relationships preserving the existing relationships. But you would still have the Rangatiratanga sphere, you would still have the Kawanatanga sphere, and the relational sphere would have representation in there from the various groups. Okay. All right, so that's the multi-sphere model. And then the next one, uh, yes, right. It's a unicameral model. I don't have a great deal to say about that. <laughs> because it was rejected. <laughs> That's actually what we have at the moment. Okay? Where you have Hapu, Iwi and the Crown all together in one. <laughs> Next one uh, is a possible bicameral. One. And in the bicameral one, you will not have that third representational stuff, the relational sphere. What this one means is that those two spheres have got to find a way to talk to each other. And they've got to, to find a way of coming to agreement. The reason for this one is a, a distrust of once you appoint representatives from those two um, the Tinoranga Tiratanga and the Crown, you lose control. It puts a distance between you and your representatives. Okay. So if you keep that away, then you, you, you still have, your representatives are still your representatives and not captured in the third one. Now, I have not in the past, since we published this um, report in 2016, I have not heard discussion, debate about these models. Okay? 
I'm, I need to hear what people think about these things. Will they work or, you know, did we hear it wrong? It doesn't matter. So long as people can think about what sort of a structure, what sort of an arrangement will work. Okay. All right. Um, now, the recommendations that came out, and these were on page 113 of the report, and I'll just make a few comments about it. Over the next five years, there was to be discussion amongst Māori. There has been heaps of discussion about amongst Māori, and it really usually runs along the lines like this. Uh, we are going to have constitutional transformation in government, whether you like it or not. We're just going to go and do it. Right. Um, can you tell me what you mean by constitutional transformation? Yeah, we're just going to make our own decision. Right. How's that going to work? Mm. Okay. So there is an understanding there of the need for it to be done. What causes me a little bit of worry is the how is not necessarily there. Okay. So the thinking is there of what the goal is, but not the how to get there. Uh, and I have to say that the ones who just take this for granted that it's going to happen whether anybody know, likes it or not is our Ramatahi. So, and that's not just Ramatahi Māori either, it's Pākehā as well. Annual agenda writer on National Hui of Lead Māori Organisations. Well, I, I can only speak for National League, we chair for on that one. It's not an annual agenda item. We have four hui a year of National Iwi Chairs Forum. I make sure it gets brought up at every single one. <laughs> so that what we're doing here is just normalising the discussion about it so that people know, you know, constitutional transformation doesn't become just a buzzword, but they actually understand what it is you're talking about. So for a long time, I used to watch these... Well, my ear is good that I can't see half the time. <laughs> The ones up in the front of me with the glassy eyes, every time this came up, a few who, who got it and just said, go for it, go for it, go for it, uh, to the point that now they go, yeah, what are we hanging around and waiting for things to do? We just got to get on and do it. So it, it's about normalising and then uh, getting on and doing it. And as a result of that, we should have a Māori Constitutional Convention in 2021. And I thought that what that Māori Constitutional Convention would do would be discuss the, the Tinoranga Tiratanga sphere and what that would look like. But I have no idea what that convention would do. Uh, and I said to Moana, what do we do in the Constitutional Convention? Moana, he said, I don't know what it is. So I, it was actually brought up in National Legal Chairs Forum last year. Why are we waiting for 2021 to have a Māori Constitutional Convention? You're having enough talk about this happening now that you should do it this year, 2020, especially because this is an election year and I'm going, I don't care what the parliament is doing. And they go, no. The people will be thinking about these sorts of things during an election year so you can get them to come and sit down and talk about what it's going to be. So on Tuesday this week, we said, National Levy Chairs Room, do you want that constitutional convention to go, Māori constitutional convention to happen this year? They went, what do you mean? What are you going to do in that convention? And so they talked about it for a while and said, well, we just bring the people together, make sure that they've got the information and ask them, what is the way ahead? What is the model that you want? And ask them to come to that hui to answer those questions. <coughs> now, what we're thinking, and this is just thinking, and we'll keep people informed about this, is that it will happen in November before the, the fourth hui of National Iwi Chairs Forum, and it'll probably take place in Tauranga, okay? Because that's where we're holding it. And for that one, I will make sure that it is Tānui far and wide. It is not just for National Language Chairs Forum. It's for everyone. We need to know what it is people have been thinking about, talking about, what will work. Okay. November this year. Uh, 
We were supposed to establish a working group to work out the structural and procedural issues for Māori. Well, we haven't done that. But I tell you what has happened is that Māori lawyers have come together asking, do you want us to help you do this sort of thing? My only worry about Māori lawyers doing this is they tend to pull on Western models. Okay? But they know very well that they cannot pull on Western models. Uh, that Māori initiate dialogue with other communities. Well, we didn't have to do that because first of all, our Pacific Island relations came to us and said, please, can we be included? We said, no problem. And then um, Indian communities came to us. Uh, Chinese communities came to us. It's the non-white communities that came to us first, but also, treaty workers, uh, quite a few Pākehā organisations, I mean, you've got me here today. Um, so, there were others, and one, in one hui, <laughs> a Pākehā fella said to me, I don't like the Kawana Tangasphere. Can I please come over into the Rangatira Tangasphere? <laughs> and the answer was really quite simple. When you're in the Kawanatanga sphere, you abide by the Kawanatanga's rules. When you're in the Rangatira Tanga sphere, you abide by the Rangatira Tanga's rules. Okay? So, you go where you're prepared to abide by what they do in the spheres. Okay? Um, so, those are um, very heartened with the um, discussion that has gone on. Uh, iwi Hapu and lead Māori organisations initiate dialogue with the Crown. Yeah, well, that's a waste of time. Uh, they keep telling me I'm supposed to go and talk to the Crown. I do not want to talk to the Crown. Um, but others do anyway. And the answer is, Doctrine of Discovery applies. Mm. Okay. And it's really interesting. You have got some good minds in Parliament, but when it comes to talking this stuff, they won't do it. Really interesting. That's why it's for the people. 2021 start organising a Trinity Convention for the country. So this is to include everything. So very, very clear that it's Māori who need to lead this. We are responsible at the end of the day for our country. But we must take the rest of the country with us. And then we have that all approved by National Iwi Chairs Forum 2016. By the way, the goal for constitutional transformation is 2040. Mm. At a time when my Mokos and my great Mokos will say, what on earth was Nanny Margaret complaining about? <laughs> it's fine, okay? Where things will all be normalised under this arrangement. Now the last thing, I'm sorry I've done so long. Some of the comments today. People do not want the unicameral model. We already <laughs> The main discussion points, each Māori group, Hapu, Iwi, will choose its own method for determining its representation. It is not necessarily one man, one vote. Some uh, whānau in particular still operate according to our old traditions where they have a natural head of the whānau who speaks for the whānau. Do not want that overruled. Others may prefer it to have a one man, one vote. Fairly clear opposition to political parties in the Māori body. Now this is because you elect your representative or you appoint your representative or whatever you do, send them to that body and they you lose them as your representative because they no longer speak for you, they speak for the party. And we have seen that in no uncertain terms with our Māori MPs within the Labour Party, sorry. But that is a reality. I can't believe how they've been, how successfully they've been gagged. There are some very good people in there, but they've been gagged. Mm -hmm. So, um, no parties. Uh, the other ones who are telling us about this as well as the Sami, they said it's wrecked their parliament having parties. In the uh, fairly substantial support for iwi, hapu, urban, and all the other mix. Okay. 
Considerable debate from which consensus has emerged that tikanga must underpin the Māori Crown relationship, which means you've got to build a relationship between you so that you can make decisions, uh, consensual decisions. Increasing Māori calls for constitutional transformation, well, actually it's not calls, it's demands. Growing support from some non-Māori groups, especially non-whites, Resistance, and the strong resistance that we should not underestimate, coming from white supremacists. So, up home, um, the CEO of Mairunanga did columns for about 18 months, just going through the whole of the Mātika Mai Aotearoa report. And she, letters to the editor of that newspaper, just, just spitting out this white supremacist hatred of Māori daring to think about anything like this. Please do not underestimate those people, but they are being counted by supportive Pākehā, and there are a very large number of Pākehā who have been asking questions about all of this stuff. So, for you, North, I'm sorry for the <laughs>